So we just completed the pilot study now on, on this project that's done um, at University of New England in collaboration with Rob and Howe at um, RMIT. So why to look into that? So at the moment, the Get Health monitoring in commercial flocks is based on gut growth pathology, looking at general lesions, signs of inflammation, um, digestion of the intestinal content. Some farms, they have a COXI monitoring program, which they look at um, score the intestines for, for the different coccidia species and also necrotic enteritis. But everyone that has seen those cases know that you can have mixed infections and it can be quite tricky to, to do the score of these lesions. So it requires um, skilled staff as it can be highly subjective. And it has no predicted value. So once you see the lesions, you already have the problem going on. And it also um, requires terminal sampling of birds, which is undesirable, especially um, if you have breeder flaws. On top of these um, gut lesions, you have other indicators that can be used to look at general gut health, such as wet litter and production data. But those factors, those indicators are influenced by many other things and they are not specific to um, gut health. So because of that, um, there are lots of biomarkers that are under investigation all over the world in many labs and Reza did a great job in explaining the tight junctions of the intestinal epithelium. That's what you expect when you have a healthy gut. And the, the opening of these tight junctions when there's any pathology. So the majority of the biomarkers to look into gut health, they um, are either looking for bird metabolites, so plasma proteins and proteins from these epithelial intestinal cells that go into the intestinal lumen and get into feces and, and litter samples, or these bacterial uh, metabolites or the whole bacteria that come and leaks from, from the gut and goes into the, the blood and the liver. There is a third um, tool that can be used to look more broadly at gut health that's not looking at the gut lining as the, the previous markers, but it's looking at the microbiota patterns using sequencing. So it's descriptive. It doesn't say um, if there's permeability in the gut. It just says that, but there's plenty of research showing that certain patterns of bacteria, they are more favorable and related to high uh, production and other patterns are less desirable and linked to lower production. So at the moment, there is nothing available that will tell you um, general gut health status. There are some limitations on, on what is available now. So some of those biomarkers, and Reza was um, talking about some of them on his presentation. They will vary uh, depending on the leaky gut model that was used. Um, they, so we probably will need a panel of those markers. There are also some issues with stability of them, especially if you're looking um, into feces and litter to, to do this check. And very important as well, there is a very high variability in the response of individual birds um, on these biomarkers. So you can find sometimes both diseased and your healthy birds with the same levels of, of the biomarker, which, which creates some issues on interpretation of the results. And of course, price is a big um, important factor to, to consider when you are looking at on-farm diagnostics. So our research 
question was based if, if those biomarkers are to be used in commercial flocks, we should probably be looking at population level samples and the population level health as the treatment on flocks are for the whole flock and the whole farm um, and not for, for individual birds. So with this in mind, we, we want to see if, um, pulled, if we would test pulled feces and, and dust, looking at microbiota disruptors such as clostridium perfringens that cause necrotic enteritis and several species of coccidium by PCR tests. And also looking at microbiota patterns in these pulled feces and dust. And if we could relate what we are seeing on these patterns with the performance in, in commercial flocks. So we first looked into experimental flocks and these are necrotic um, interacts models that were conducted here um, at UNE by Shubiel Wu Lab. So here is the profile um, for Amira Cervolina brunetti and Maxima in dust. So pulled feces have been used to detect um, coccidia for a very long time. We just want to see on this study if we could find um, different profiles in, in flocks with subclinical necrotic enteritis and clinical necrotic enteritis. And we could see some differences. We also um, did a pilot study um, looking at the different microbiota profiles in these um, population level samples, such as uh, looking at litter and feces and dust. And we could find some signature, but we, we were unsure on how it would uh, relate to, to commercial flocks. So the next step um, was to look, do a pilot study in, and we looked in eight farms. So we approached two integrator companies and we followed four farms that were high, consistently high ranked um, in terms of productivity within the company and four farms that were low ranked. We collected um, those samples that using these funnels that would just hang on these vertical wires in the sham and um, pulled feces from different locations of, of shed. We look at two sheds per farm. And we ask them to collect samples um, every week until day 35 of the cycle. So what we found was, um, here you can see the plots for the detection of a Miriam um, Osorvolina, and at the bottom, the area maximum. So here are the levels. These are just DNA detection of those, those pathogens. So each line represents one farm and the solid lines are top ranked farms and the dashed lines are low ranked farms. So in summary, all of those flocks were positive for both Amira Servolina and, and maximum. And for Servolina, we found um, a peak of detection around day 21 and 28 of the cycle, and then uh, a decrease, probably due to, to build up of immunity. The profiles for Amaria Maxima were a little bit more varied, and there is no pattern if they were high ranked. We have both um, a tendency to decrease after day 28 until day 35, um, 35 a decrease on, on the load. And some of these high producing farms continue increasing over um, this 30 day mark where when we stop looking to that. Um, we could not find, um, ten, we didn't find Tanella Necatrix in any of the day flocks we looked and there was only one farm that was positive for Brunetti at the end of the cycle. So based on that, the detection levels were not related to performance. There was no um, evident link, probably because the levels that, that we looked here were low. If you consider the standard when um, for the OSIS count per gram of feces, which was around this, this threshold to be at low risk 
for coccidiosis. When we looked at Clostridium perfringens detection um, as a proxy for necrotic enteritis, we found very low levels of Clostridium, which we're expecting to find um, in the majority of the farms. We're expecting to find um, a little bit of a higher um, detection rate. There was only one farm that was top ranked that was positive for Clostridium perfringens, and that was the only farm that was positive for NAPI toxin. So we know that NAPI toxin is a predisposing factor um, and considered to give virulence to these Clostridium perfringens strains. But the fact um, such was that there was nothing, um, no gut symptom or clinical sign related on, on this block. So it was interesting. Again, no clear relationship of detection level and, and performance. When we looked at the microbiota profiles in dust and pulled feces, um, here is the, the, the overview. So these are company A and B. Each one of those dots is, represents one sample, the closer, the dots are the more similar is this microbiota profile, the more um, distant, the more dissimilar. So as you can see here on the plot for company, the, the highest variation we had on the data set was related to company. So company A here is in yellow, and you can see a clear differentiation on the profiles from company B here in blue. And there was a bigger difference than what we, we looked when we looked at the data on high versus low um, performance among those flocks. Despite this overlap that you can see here, we could still find some um, bacteria, some different genera of bacteria that, that they were much more prevalent on, on low producing flocks compared to the high producing flocks. We are sampling an additional 30 farms, um, which include the third company, so we can um, further investigate these differences on the microbiota profile between the different farms. And um, yeah. So the key findings from this pilot study we've done so far is that both pulled feces and dust could be used to detect um, this coccidia, clostridium, and looked at uh, microbiota signatures. The feedback we had from the veterinarians and the farmers was that dust was far more convenient to, to collect, and we are doing the second phase of the project using dust only. There are some issues on transport and, and keeping the cold chain for, for the fecal samples as well. So the levels of coccidium clostridium were similar in high and low ranked farms, but overall the coccidia levels were low in all study flocks. So all of them were on coccidial drugs and none of them vaccinated for, for clostridium, sorry, for coccidium. And it was interesting to see the clostridium not be uh, detected in, in one high ranked farm, but no relationship with um, clinical science for necrotic enteritis. There is some evidence of differential microbial pattern in high and low rank farms, and we are looking forward for um, the second phase of the, the project that we can see if the markers that we found before will, um, can, will be replicated on the second phase. So that was all for me, thank you.